This is The Stage Show. Hello, I'm Claire Nichols. And today, the Australian musical theatre star Geraldine Turner is here. Take it away. Come on, baby, why don't we put the town? And all that jazz, I'm gonna rouge my knees and roll my stockings down. And all that jazz, start to call, I know it would be a spot where the gin is cold, but the piano is hot. It's just a noisy hall where there's a nightly brawl and all that jazz. Oh, I listened to that recording so many times in my house when I was growing up. That is Geraldine Turner belting all that jazz in the 1981 Sydney Theatre Company production of Chicago. And Geraldine is the headline act today on the stage show with me, Claire Nichols. I'm looking after the show for Michael Cathcart for a few weeks while he embarks on his own theatrical project. Now, Geraldine Turner has had an incredible career here in Australia in musicals, in theatre and on screen. She started performing in the 1970s and really she's never stopped and she's written about her performing life but also a very painful personal life in a new memoir called Turner's Turn. Geraldine Turner, welcome to the stage show. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm so pleased. Oh, it's very exciting for me too. Uh, That production of Chicago in Australia, it was iconic really. You played Velma, Nancy Hayes was Roxy. It was what you call in the book your first big leading lady, centre stage, hands up in the air role. Do you remember what the reaction was like when you performed in that show? Yes, because we we ended up, it was supposed to be a six-week season at the Drama Theatre at the Sydney Opera House and we transferred after six weeks because we sold standing room every night and we transferred to the Theatre Royal and we ended up doing three seasons at the Theatre Royal. We ended up playing for two years and then the third year we went to the Hong Kong Arts Festival. So I think it is still today, I may be wrong, but I think it's still the highest grossing show ever at the Sydney Theatre Company. So it was it was astonishing and, and I remember I write in the book about the first gypsy run, a gypsy run for people who don't know, is a after you've done the dress rehearsals and before the first preview, you invite friends and family and and we didn't know, you know, we'd been working hard. We thought it was really good and everything, but we didn't know. And I came on to do all that jazz and all all the ensemble came on and did this fabulous Ross Coleman choreography. And at the end of it, the audience stood up and cheered. I couldn't it actually stopped the show. And we walked off and I thought, oh my God, we're a hit. And, and of course, we were. It was just thrilling, really mm. thrilling. And I guess what made this so special too was this was not a cookie-cutter reproduction of a Broadway show. In fact, this predated the 1997 Broadway revival that people probably know. Yeah. Uh, how unusual was it at that time to have a brand-new staging of a musical done here in Australia? I think it was quite rare. We had had all-Australian casts for many years because, of course, when I first started out in show business and be, just before my time, all the big companies imported the leading roles and the Australians just played the supporting roles. But, of course, we'd had Australians doing leading roles, but we hadn't had an Australian team, you know. So Richard Werrett directed it, Brian Thompson did the sets, Roger Kirk did the costumes, Ross Coleman did the choreography. So it was a completely new production. And, um, yeah, that was really wonderful to be a part of. I mean, I've done a lot of productions that are reproductions as well and you have to, you know, bring your talent to that. But it's a different thing to create something, you know, on the floor. That's a wonderful thing and that's what we did with Chicago. And people talk about it to this day, that production, you know. It, it really was fantastic. Yeah, I called my mum actually and said, Mum, did you know that soundtrack we have apparently now a collector's item? <laughs> yes, it probably is. I'm holding on tight to that one. Did that show open up a lot of doors for you after being Velma? Um, Yeah, probably, yeah. I had done terrific roles up until that time, a lot of terrific roles. I'd been working since I was a child, really. But, yeah, that was a big sort of leading lady, as you say, you know, in the centre with my arms up, you know. And I think the next big thing I did was Nancy and Oliver, a tour of that, and that was a great part for me because Nancy is – yeah, she has to be brash and, you know, she sings big notes, all those chest notes that I can do, and she dances and all of that. But she also is lovely with the children and she also 
gets killed by Bill Sykes at the end of the play and sings As Long As He Needs Me, which is one of the best songs ever written for musical theatre. So, look, that was a great part for me as well. So, that yeah, that was the next thing I did, I think, yeah, after Chicago. Let's go back to your childhood. You grew up in Brisbane in the 50s and 60s. There was you, your mum and dad, four brothers. Your mother seems to have really been the dominant figure in your childhood. Absolutely, huge, and still is in my life. Even though she's dead and she's been dead a long time now, you know, she's never left me really. And um, she was obviously, there was something wrong with her uh, mentally. And in those days, you didn't talk about anything like that. Everyone just sort of brushed it aside. She used to take these kind of, well, I would call them fits on the bus and it's obvious when I grew up, I realised that it came out of trauma and obviously something had happened to her and I'll never know what because I've ne- never spoken to her about it because we weren't allowed to talk about her outbursts on the bus. What, what, what were they like? What was an outburst on the bus? Well, she'd get down, she'd suddenly just get down on the floor of the bus and start swearing and saying that the, the, the bus driver was wanting to have sex with her in, in, in much more crude terms than that. And she'd say, somebody help me, and she'd pull at her clothes and everyone on the bus would just stare out the window and I would be a little girl and I would stare out the window too as if she wasn't with me. And then she'd come back and sit down and slap me and say, don't tell your father. That must have been so frightening for you. Terrible. And so I never told my father and it wasn't until Years and years and years later when my mother died and everyone gathers the night before the funeral, you'll fly in from everywhere and my four older brothers were there and I made dinner for them all and somebody brought up the bus and she'd done it with all of us and she'd said to all of us, don't tell your father, don't you speak about this and no one had ever told anybody. Isn't that extraordinary? What, What did she want for you? What did she want for Geraldine? Oh, she wanted to live through me. She had wanted to be on the stage and her father wouldn't let her. She was born in 1913 and um, she did get a job backstage at the old Theatre Royal, I think, and she was a a dresser and seamstress for um, George Wallace, the famous um, Queensland comedian, Uh, his half-sister, Babe Scott. She worked for her. So she did get a job backstage, but she had a great voice, my mother, a great singing voice. And she had very good timing, comedy timing. She could tell a story really well. So she wanted to be on the stage and it never happened for her. So when she had this little girl after four boys, I was everything to her. And, you know, I went to ballet class from five and then she wanted me to be a ballerina at first. And then she discovered I could sing better than I could dance. So then she sent me to the conservatorium and I was to be the greatest singer, you know. So, (laughs) I mean, I keep saying to people, thank God I had talent. What would she have done? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, so I, I guess she wanted the world for me and I was very pleased that before she died she did see my name in lights and she did see me on a billboard outside a big theatre and, you know, I, I'm very pleased that she she saw that. That was a good thing for her to see. What about your dad, Geraldine? You describe him as kind but weak. What was he like? Exactly that. He was a very kind man and he wanted us all to get on, but we never did. The boys never got on. They, my brothers, they were always having punch-ups and there were holes in the wall in our house where they'd go through the wall and, oh, it was terrible. And alcohol was a big thing in our family. I'm not a drinker because I could see what it did. You know, my dad was a drinker and um, when he was drunk, he turned into someone else, you know, and, and he would hit my mother and we would often be at emergency with her head split open or something, you know. Yeah, terrible, terrible, terrible thing. And when you're a child amidst all of that violence, it you can't help but blame yourself somehow. I, I blamed myself. I don't know why I did, but but I did. I thought it must have been my fault. And And growing up with that is a terrible thing, you know. It's a burden on a child, I think. But at other times when Dad wasn't drunk, and he wasn't drunk every night, I wouldn't want you to think that, it was probably you know, once every two weeks or something like that, once every three weeks. It wasn't every night. But the rest of the time he was the most charming, lovely man. And, uh, yeah, I, I don't understand their relationship at all. But, um, yeah, there was a lot of violence involved in it. Mm. And I should just say, listeners, uh, if this conversation is raising anything for you, do remember you can contact the National Family Violence Counselling Service by calling 1-800-RESPECT. That's 1-800-737-732. Geraldine, you said there your mum 
really pushed you to be a performer. But do you remember when you decided that you wanted a life on the stage? No. No, I don't. Apparently I was taken to a pantomime when I was five and I came home and said I want to be on the stage. But my mother told me that story so many times that I don't know if I actually said it or it was her who wanted me to do that. But anyway, I was sent to ballet classes from five and um, – I was in a television show on Channel 7 in Brisbane called Cotty's Happy Hour in the Channel 7 Junior Ballet by the time I was eight. So I was always, you know, doing professional things as a child. It's ridiculous really, isn't it? Um, but, um, yeah, I, it was just something I was always going to do. It wasn't a decision, if you know what I mean. It wasn't I woke up one day and thought I want to be on the stage. It was just a given. That's what I was going to do. Yeah, by the time you were 10, you were performing with the Borovansky Ballet. That went on to become the Australian Ballet. There was a woman who looked after the young dancers, including you, and you asked her to sign your autograph book at the end of the season. Yes. Tell me what she wrote in the book. Well, for all the other kids, she wrote, you know, oh, you've, you're so talented, you'll go far and things like this. And I read all, we all read each other's, you know, autograph books. Me, I, I know it word for word. I remember it word for word. She wrote, a lovely little girl with a pretty smile. Stay as sweet as you are and keep on smiling. And I, I knew at my young age that was code for you have no talent and I don't know what to write. <laughs> no. I mean, do you, think, do you think that was true? Do you think you weren't as good as the other kids or what was going on there? I don't know. I thought I was good, but she obviously didn't. She obviously didn't think, you know, a lovely little girl with a pretty smile, you know, go away. I wanted her to say, you're going to be a huge star, but she didn't. Anyway, look, you know, she's probably nothing now. <laughs> and you've gone so far. <laughs> where, do you think, where do you think your drive has come from to succeed in the performing arts? Gee, probably from my mother, I probably. But, um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I've always had a great work ethic and I think I got that from my mother. I had good training. I, I went to Phyllis Danaher's dance school in Brisbane and, as I said, I went to Queensland Conservatorium and then I, I was in the first company of the Queensland Theatre Company when it was first starting. It's now called Queensland Theatre. That's when Alan Edwards was the artistic director and I, I was there for two years and I guess I got a lot of training in acting uh, in those two years. I don't know where I've got my drive from. I, drive to be better and better and better, I think. I mean, I'd, I've never rested on my laurels. You know, it was the great Harold Prince, Broadway producer said um, and director, said, all your life you want to get there. And when you get there, you realise there's no there there. I think that's right. I think, you know, I always say everything's relative. I'm sure, you know, Barbara Streisand sits at home and says, if only I were Bette Midler, you know. <laughs> I, I just think, you never stop growing and learning. And, and if you do, then you should give up. Yeah. Uh, back at Queensland Theatre Company, um, you spoke to another actor, Murray Foy. He taught you a pre-show mantra. Yes. Uh, can, can you share the pre-show mantra? Yes. He said, um, I'm beautiful, I'm talented and I have a secret. And I've used it a lot during my career and I've shared it with other actors too. Just to settle yourself in the wings just before you walk on, if you say to yourself, I'm beautiful, I'm talented and I have a secret and then walk on. Of course, the secret is what you're about to do. And it's, it's a lovely thing, isn't it? It's great. Are there any other pre-show traditions that you've kept up through your career? I like to arrive at the theatre very early. I'm always the first there, apart from, you know, the stage management and, and uh, dresses, etc. cetera. Um, sound people. I'm always first there. I like to walk out onto an empty stage and just stand there for a while. It's a lovely thing to think about all of the people who came before you and stood right where you were standing and um, maybe had some triumphs, maybe had some disappointments along the way and just that, you know, the ghost of the theatre that can spur you on that night and I just stand there and think about all of that and then go back to my dressing room and take, I take a long time to put my makeup on and I tend to do the same things in the same order. I quite like that. I quite like that tradition. And, yeah, you know, I, I, I've never been late to the theatre or, you know, just arrived at the half-hour call or something. I, I could never do that. I have to be there hours early. <laughs> mm. In 1973, uh, you performed in your first Sondheim show. That was A Little Night Music. And this was the beginning of quite a long relationship with Sondheim's music for you. Um, tell me what it is about singing a Sondheim piece that is so unique. 
I think actors love doing Sondheim because, you know, he's such a great um, lyricist. I mean, he great, writes, writes great music as well, of course, but he's such a, he sort of stands to the side and observes life very well. So it's very good stuff for an actor. And really you don't have to work out a way to do a Sondheim song to make it interesting. It already is. You just have to follow the punctuation marks and um, bring your talent to it, really. That's all you have to do. So, yes, I did I did Petra in A Little Night Music, uh, who has the marvellous song The Miller's Son, and then years later I played Desiree, the leading role. Um, in fact, I've done Tes- Desiree twice, ten years apart. So, mm. Well, I think everyone wants to hear you sing a little Sondheim. Here's you singing Another Hundred People. Another Hundred People just got off of the train and came up to the ground while another hundred people just got off of the bus and are looking around at another hundred people who got off of the plane who are looking at us who got off of the train and the plane and the bus maybe yesterday. It's a city of strangers Some come to work, some to play A city of strangers Some come to stare, some to stay And every day The ones who stay Can find each other in the crowded streets In the garden parks By the rusty fountains and the dusty trees With the battered box That's Geraldine Turner singing Another Hundred People from the musical company. That's from her 1997 album, The Stephen Sondheim Songbook. Geraldine, did you get to meet Stephen Sondheim? Oh, yeah, lots. Um, I first got to meet him in 1977. Um, A woman called Amy McGrath put together this, what she called an International Music Theatre Forum at the Conservatorium in Sydney and managed to get Harold Prince, Stephen Sondheim and Alan J. Lerner to come out to Australia to it. Extraordinary. And I was quite a young girl. I sang on the Australian Musicals Day. I sang um, some songs from um, a musical version of The Harp in the South and um, some songs from a show called That Mrs Langtree about Lily Langtree. And I knew it had gone well with the audience, but I was getting changed backstage and a note came around, would you have supper with us from Hal Prince and Stephen Sondheim? So I thought, oh, what am I doing tonight? I have to look <laughs> at my diary. So, <laughs> so I met them in this someone's house, I can't remember whose house it was, on the north shore of Sydney somewhere and um, I walked in and Stephen Sondheim was sitting there with a didgeridoo which he'd bought from the opera house shop and wouldn't let it go all evening. And, uh, yeah, that's when I first met him and I had a kind of relationship with him over the decades really when I'd go to New York we'd see each other or he'd call or whatever and because I did the Sondheim album, I did two actually, the first Sondheim album I did happened to be the first solo Sondheim album in the world. We didn't know that when we were making it, but it was closely followed by, I think, Cleo Lane doing a Sondheim album and then Julie Wilson doing a Sondheim album and then Barbara Streisand brought out a Broadway album which had a lot of Sondheim in it soon after that. So I discovered myself on the cover of an American theatre magazine with Sondheim in the middle and myself and Julie Wilson and Cleo Lane and it said Sondheim's Ladies. So, you know, that was extraordinary stuff. And um, as I said, I did two albums and the second album he was unhappy with some of the um, harmonies that we changed in, in the arrangements of the songs and I've got so many letters back and forth from Steve saying, you know, it should just be your voice that's different. And I kept saying, but it can't just be the Broadway arrangements. Who's going to buy my album? You know, if it's the Broadway arrangement, they buy the original cast recording. Or I said, I'm not somebody famous like Barbara Streisand or someone like that. You know, I've got to have a difference in the songs so that people will buy my album, my version of it. And then he ended up writing back and saying, Barbara Streisand respects me, Geraldine. Why can't you? (gasps) (laughs) I didn't know whether to be flattered or upset. Um, who who won that argument? I mean, what happened in the end? We both just walked away. He, you know, we couldn't agree on it. The album was coming out anyway. And um, I'd already cut a couple of songs. I sent it to him before it came out because we included some songs from his very early career when he was at college. We recorded a couple of those and he didn't want them on the album. So I said, fine, they're gone, they're gone, they're cut, you know. So we'd already done that, got, gone through that, and then then he was on about the harmonies, you know, which is fair enough. Look, I do understand it. Richard Rogers was exactly the same. They want their original harmonies and that's that, and I, can, I get that absolutely. But no, we just both walked away from it and that was that. And next time I saw him, he was absolutely fine. We didn't mention it again, so 
lucky for me. <laughs> yeah, I think in the book you describe him as a little scary but always fair. That's right. He was tough but fair. That's right. Absolutely right. And I, I like that you held your own in that argument with Stephen Sondheim. I mean, looking at your career, it seems like you've had so many successes. Does that mean you didn't have to be insecure, you didn't have to doubt yourself, or <laughs> did, you, did you have those same doubts that we all have? Is that a joke? Of course I have doubts and, of course, I don't have much confidence. It would surprise a lot of people. I'm not very good at, like, the simplest things like taking something back to a shop that's not right or something. I can't do it. You know, I'm too scared of the people in the shop. Isn't that ridiculous? And yet I can stand in front of thousands of people and sing. I don't get it. I guess they're not quite near me. They're out there in the dark and I'm just doing my thing, you know, whereas someone in a shop might judge me. <laughs> Pathetic, really. <laughs> but does that mean, I mean, do you get nervous before oh, you go yeah. on stage? Terribly nervous. And, and sometimes it's undone me. Sometimes I, in my life, my I'm sure a lot of singers know this, your throat sort of closes over and you think, my God, I'm not going to be able to sing tonight. You know, it's terrifying. And um, it never goes away, that sort of fear, I think. Mm. I mean, you are known as the singer with that big voice that we've been um, so enjoying listening to. Have there been moments when that voice has abandoned you or hasn't been at the strength where you need it to be? Yes, and I talk about it in the book. And I talk about when my best friend, Bill Shanahan, who was also my agent and manager, died. And I was just suffering from grief. And, and I had a, a booking at the Tilbury Hotel, which doesn't exist anymore. It was a, a venue in Sydney a cabaret venue. And I kept putting off the opening because my voice wasn't working properly. And my voice was working properly. It was just the grief, you know, because most of singing is really to do with confidence that you can hit that note. The minute you think I've got that big note coming up, I wonder, will I hit it? You won't, you know, it's as simple as that. And so they said to me, the managers of the venue said to me, you have to open, you have to come in and do the show. And I think it was like a four week season or something. It was the worst season of my life. I would go in there and I would sometimes go for a note and nothing would be there and I'd point to a note pathetically, point in the air as if I was <laughs> pointing to the note. And I was just I just wanted the earth to open and swallow me up. And so many people during that season, so many people in the audience said, it's the best I've ever seen you, that I had to think about it. I tell this story if I'm ever taking a masterclass or something. And I it really made me think. And it was an epiphany, really, because up until that point in my life, I'd had much success and I'd always been, as you said, that girl with the big voice and she could do anything with her voice and my voice wasn't working properly. So I had to bring more of me forward. I had to joke more with the audience. I had to be more engaging. All of those things that you're supposed to do all the time in performing, I had to do more of because my voice wasn't the way I wanted it to be. And I realised that, you know, say that, say your favourite ballet dancer was Baryshnikov and you got a ticket to see him when he was dancing and you went to see him and he came on stage and he fell out of his pirouette. Would you like him any less? No, because he's Baryshnikov. He's more than the sum of his parts. And the epiphany for me was I thought, it's me they like. It's not my voice. All those years I thought it was my voice that people liked. It was me they liked. I'd never thought that before. And so, of course, you know, we all want to sing all the right notes and we all want to have our voice in the best shape it can be in. But I say to students, look for what's inside you. That's what connects with an audience, not your singing voice. Otherwise, everybody in the ensemble would be a star because they all sing very well. So, you know, it, it's who you are that they like, the audience. Yeah. Um, now, you've been performing for 50 years, Geraldine. Mm -hmm. it, it strikes me as an incredibly hard thing to do, especially here in Australia, where we don't have a huge musical theatre industry. What do you think has been the key to longevity for you? I think you have to adapt and you have to I, – I think it's very difficult, particularly for women, I think it's difficult that decade of 40 to 50 – because I'm 71 now. God, who thought I'd ever be 71? Old people are 71. But that decade between 40 and 50 is very difficult because you still see yourself as the leading lady, which you are, of course. But they suddenly cast, particularly on television and in film, when you're 42, 43, they're going for someone who's 45 in the script. They'll cast a 36-year-old. 
So that decade is your sort of crossover decade as a woman into sort of older roles. And I think it's a difficult thing to to bridge those years. But once you get to 50, it all sort of starts coming back to you again. Well, that's what I think anyway. That's what happened to me and it's happened to a lot of women. When we started this conversation, we spoke about that production of Chicago, which was so unique in so many ways. I I wanted to finish with you just reflecting, Geraldine, on what's happening in Australian musical theatre right now. We see a lot of uh, big productions tour here from America, from the West End. What do you make of the state of musical theatre here in Australia right now? I think a lot of people love musical theatre and keep going to it, and that's a great thing. I think ticket prices are a lot, and they are on Broadway too in the West End. I mean, it makes it a bit elitist in a way. But um, Yeah, I mean, I think that um, I'd like to see more Australian musicals get up. I'd like to see more original Australian teams, you know, productions get up uh, so that we're not just doing reproductions of American and and British shows. And I do think it's the musical theatre's changed. You know, when I was a child and growing up, we couldn't wait for the next Broadway show album to come out so that we could hear the songs and then go and see the show and go and see these new songs. People tend to now with Disney you see the cartoon, then they put real people into those roles and put the show on stage and then you go and see it again. But you already know all the songs because the kids have watched it on DVD a million times. It's a different thing. People don't want to go and see shows with songs they don't know anymore. They want to know everything about the show before they go, before they spend the money. And I think that's the difference. It's not worse or or better. It's just different. Mm. Geraldine Turner, it's been so wonderful to speak with you today. Thank you for your time. Oh, thank you. I've absolutely loved it. Thanks. And Geraldine Turner's memoir is called Turner's Turn. It's published by New Holland. And I do want to hear that huge singing voice just one more time. So let's let Geraldine take us out with another Sondheim classic. Somebody force me to care. Wow, Geraldine Turner.